So yes, we need to know this, but also, don't we have to get smarter at how we then deal with these issues? Look again, if you, if you look at temperatures and say, whoa, people are going to die more from heat waves, we should do something about that. Do you remember uh, the, the, the thing that everybody mentions also, Al Gore, is the great European heat wave in August 2003, uh, where about uh, 7,500 people died in, just in Paris, France alone from heat in a couple of days. The argument then is to say, we need to cut our carbon emissions to assure that those people will not die in the future. Now, of course, there's, first of all, something odd about the fact that you say, yeah, we're going to avoid more people dying from heat, but of course, we're going to have even more people die from cold, which is not a very smart idea. But also, let's just take a look at what actually kills people. This is the data that we have uh, for, for the US. Uh, this is from Philadelphia, but we have this for all states, and it looks, uh, uh, sorry, all, all major cities, it looks pretty much the same. If you look, this is the temperature out this way, and the deaths up this way. Just take a look at the black line, and this is a very, very typical line. What you see is around 80 degrees Fahrenheit in, in Philadelphia, there's the fewest people dying. If it gets warmer, more people die. If it gets colder, more people die. Not very surprising. This is what we see everywhere. Obviously, it's different in Finland and in uh, Rio de Janeiro, where the optimal point is, but there's such a correlation both places. Now, notice what's happened. This was the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. First of all, we've gotten much better at uh, uh, avoiding people dying simply because we have better medical technology. But also notice another thing we pretty much avoided cold heat deaths in Philadelphia. And this is actually true for all over in the US. Why? Because you guys have air conditioning. So again, my point here is to say, if we want to help people not die from heat, shouldn't we give them air conditioning? Isn't it odd that you make the argument and say, isn't it terrible that 7,500 people died in Paris, France? We should avoid that by cutting carbon emissions. Of course, yes, it'll mean that it'll get warmer and warmer, and more and more people will die, but slightly less more people will die towards the end of the century from heat. Instead of saying, hey, let's give them air conditioning and nobody will die. Wouldn't that be a better idea? B both be much, much cheaper and I'd actually achieve the goal that we want. This is the kind of common sense that I'd like us to start thinking about and saying, yes, we need to find smart alternatives. Another one, perhaps an even more sellable point in, in many of your communities is to realize that heat is mainly a problem of May major cities. We have heat islands in most major cities. We know, for instance, that London, LA, New York is much warmer than the surrounding countryside. It's about four degrees centigrade, about seven degrees Fahrenheit. And Tokyo, wow, okay, what? Well, I'm back. Uh, Tokyo takes the absolute uh, 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 top by actually being almost 20 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than its surrounding countryside. Why? Because there's lots of black stuff and a lack of water features. There's basically no water that evaporates and makes cities cooler. There's no greenery and there's very much tarmac. So why don't we do something about that? We actually know that we could do much, much more. If you look, for instance, in London, they've looked at this. If you in, 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 in introduce water features, more parks, apart from the fact that it would be much, much more beautiful, it would actually reduce daytime heat temperatures at heat waves about 8 degrees centigrade or about uh, 13 degrees Fahrenheit. Much, much more than global warming would ever do. It would be much cheaper. It would do much more good, and by the way, it would also be much more beautiful. And likewise, of course, and this sounds almost silly in its sensibleness, but we could start painting some of the tarmac white. We could start painting some of the rooftops white. We know that if we decrease the, uh, uh, sorry, increase the white or the light surfaces in London by about half, we could cut daytime maximum temperatures about 10 degrees centigrade or about 18 degrees Fahrenheit. So again, the point here is there's much cheaper, much better alternative. If what we want to do is actually to make sure that fewer people die from heat waves, why is it we're consciously saying, let's pick the worst but most costly solution to deal with that problem? Why don't we fix it the smartest and cheapest way? That's the double point that I want to get towards you. We're being faced with a very one-sided story. More people are going to die from heat, and we forget to tell that even more people are not going to die from coal. And then we're also being told, and the answer is cut carbon emissions. Whereas in reality, there's much, much better answers if we really want to help those poor people, for instance, in Paris, France, from not dying in August in 2030. So again, the argument here is, why don't we have a smarter conversation? Likewise, with sea level rise, if you take a look at sea level rise, will it rise because of global warming? Absolutely. 
We know that sea levels will probably rise, but not the catast no, sorry, catastrophic levels that Al Gore comes out and tells us. The UN climate panel is telling us it's going to be somewhere between half and two feet of sea level rise. The most likely is about one foot over the next 100 years. Now, that's not the 20 foot that you saw in Al Gore's movie. Most of you guys have probably seen, most of you guys have probably seen the, uh, the Al Gore movie, even if you haven't seen the movie, at least you've seen the clip because it's certainly the most viewed clip where you see you know, Florida being inundated by a wall of, uh, of, of sea rise of, of 20 feet. And likewise, you see San Francisco being uh, eliminated. You see um, Holland disappearing. You see Dakar. You see Shanghai. It's a very long movie. You see Beijing. And, and it has very visual, visually very strong impact. But of course, that's not what the scientists are actually telling us. They're telling us it's about one foot. Now, a one foot sea level rise is a problem, yes, but it's not the end of the world. Let me just remind you, over the last 150 years, sea levels rose about one foot. Yet, did anyone notice? Imagine asking a very old person who lived through most of the 20th century, likely to be a woman, and ask her, what were the important things that happened in the 20th century? She'll talk about the world wars, maybe the suffrage for women, maybe even the IT revolution, but she will not say, and sea levels rose. And it underscores the point of saying this is a logistical problem, but it's not the end of the world. Actually, there's just a study out today uh, that I just noticed this morning uh, from Bangladesh that shows that Bangladesh, while sea levels have been rising, has actually added eight square miles to its surface area every year since the 1970s. Why? Because, of course, yes, sea levels are rising. That gives a problem. But at the same time, people are also being smarter, people being richer. They can actually deal with more. And that gets me back to that same point again. Let's just start having a conversation about what are the smart things to do. If we look at a one-foot sea level rise, take a look at the Maldives because they're so, they're so cool to look at, right? And people like to go there. Yes, if we just imagine that everybody stayed the very same thing, one foot sea level rise will actually eradicate 77% of the Maldives. The cost will be a phenomenal 121% of GDP. Now, this is the kind of argument that many people will tell you that we have to do something about that. But of course, the curious point is that sort of assumes that the people in the Maldives are going to be standing like this for the next 100 years and you know, start seeing the sea lap up over their knees and say, wow, this doesn't look good, and stand still for the next 80 years. That's not how most people act. Actually, we know from these same models that the UN Climate Panel shows that at 0.04% of GDP, the Maldives can safeguard virtually everything of their dry land. Will they do that? Will they spend 0.04% of their GDP to avoid a loss of 121%? Of course they will, just like the, Hol uh, the Dutch did. And of course, the point here again is to start realizing people actually act just like the Bangladeshis have done. This is actually true also for Bangladesh and Vietnam, which is even more uh, vulnerable than, than Bangladesh, and all of the other areas. Let me just give you one sense, and this is again one of the UN Climate Panel uh, uh, scenarios. The UN has two main scenarios. It has an economic future and an environmental future. It's called A1 and B1 for the technically minded. The, the economic future focuses mainly on economics, hence it'll have a higher sea level rise. It'll probably be about 34 centimeters, about uh, a foot, a little more than a foot. But it will also have a higher economy. The average per person uh, uh, GDP in the world will be about $73,000. That's a huge amount. It's more than what the U.S. is right now. And notice this is a global average. Of course, this is because we're expecting China and many others uh, to increase you know, six to 12 fold, uh, whereas the U.S. and many other uh, Western economies are inc going to increase some two to four times. We'll still be richer, but much less richer than some of the other countries. This will be a great world, but of course, it'll have a problem. It'll have a problem with sea level rise about one foot.